Some of the things that I, I think, the things that, that I both um, energize me and, and um, drive me to despair at the same time. The experiences we were talking about, being around dedicated, caring, commitment, hard working, go to the whatever, we'll do whatever you can do to make something happen. That's the, we have these events not because they're always sharing a whole lot of new stuff, but it, you need to be reinforced with this sort of camaraderie of people who share your visions and values. Um, the association memberships in, in groups who are advocating for the kids we're talking about are dwindling. Now, now does that mean that they're irrelevant and we should just shut them down? That causes me a lot of concern. You know, why is it so hard to get uh, young people who go through training programs understand that a meaningful career means meaningfully affiliated? But they'll go out and they'll get in their little quarters and they won't spend 60 or $80 for a membership. They won't read a journal, even though you tell them they have to the day after they get their license. And to me, that you were talking, no, it was Mark this morning talking about system support. Uh, and and on I have struggled with uh, is it a time is it time for CEC for example and don't take this liver is it time for CEC this says CEC run its course and no longer serves the purpose I mean the membership would suggest that it keeps going down 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 well maybe maybe rather than try to build it up maybe we should say we should shut it down because it's not doing something I don't want to go there what's happening in our own subdivision CCBD membership has declined steadily for the last four or five years. Why? What's so difficult? Uh, why is it so difficult? I think part of it is our own fault. And, and I'll be interested in your comments. I, I, you know, I, I share with people, I think we are our own issues when, and this is like the, when you were talking about inclusion, which is a two-sided coin. Going down the inclusion bandwagon uh, basically said to everybody, including general ed in particular, but I think more specifically our own trainees, that they, if they want to be in accepted in inclusionary settings, they don't want to be identified with subgroups that aren't there. I mean, that's my, and so we, by pushing this bandwagon, have cut them off from the only support system they have in the settings where they work. I don't know if you follow what I'm saying? Then they last there two or three years because there is no support system and they say, this is too hard, I'm getting out. And I, I just frankly think it's too hard to train people to work with these kids for such short careers. We have to figure out a way that is child sensitive, but it's also doesn't destroy teachers in the first three to five years of their career. And I don't think we've done I think we know how to do it, but the system support is not there. Well, I don't know. I, I, I've thought about this quite a little bit, but I'm, I, I don't know what the future is. But, you know, ideally, if we could continue and accelerate the training of some really positive, you know, positive training for people to work with these kind of kids, and uh, build in systems in schools so that they don't, as soon as they leave training programs, they don't forget everything they were taught, uh, then we probably could see some long-term effects of, of the, uh, well, outcomes for kids. Uh, I'm a little discouraged when I look at the federal government and its, its role that it's got with with our kids. Uh, I think the money's going to be drying up. I, a few years ago, I really had a lot of excitement that thinking that probably there's going to be some new initiatives with juvenile justice kids and trying to get down to the bottom, you know, brass tacks in terms of providing services for those kids too. But those seem to be kind of swept under the rugs, at least from where I, I sit. Um, so I don't know. I. Whether, whether the future's bright or whether it's dim, I'm, I'm not <laughs> sure. It's kind of, part of it has to do, I think, with the waves of, of uh, the political mm -hmm. scene. 
and right now it ain't a pretty sleep. I prepare my, my students, my doctoral students, who I dearly love, who go off and continue the mission, who say, I want to go into urban settings, who describe themselves as urban special educators, who are looking for ways that they can <coughs> make a difference and truly have that passion, then that is extremely rewarding to me. And that just makes my day. It makes a lot of days for me. And uh, just the other day, I was on the phone talking with one of my students. And, um, and my students come in all hues, genders, colors, what have you. Um, uh, this happens to be a young African-American woman. She's uh, just as bright as they come, extremely passionate. And I'm saying to her, you've got to get back here and get your doctorate before I leave. <laughs> um, and she's going to do it. She's doing wonderful things in, in the classroom. And um, on one hand, and I have mixed emotions, because on one hand, I want people like that in the classroom. But on the other hand, I see her as so talented. I want her to prepare, to clone herself, you know, 250 times. Um, so. Uh, you know, I say to my students uh, regularly that next to parenting, this is the most important job in the world. And you and you have to believe in yourself and, and to know that. And so you don't, we don't have a wide margin of error. We can't go into that classroom and say, this is an off day. You've got to try to be on it every day. And uh, so I, I, uh, I definitely, encourage uh, young people to do it um, and, uh, and I I do think it's important to stay open to the possibilities to learn to know the history of the field enough to know where what's been helpful in the past but then to keep con recontexting it always mm -hmm. and I'd really encourage people not to hold their cards too close to their vest to, to reach out to others and to know others so that it, 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 this community can go it, this group of kids in the past has not been one that there was a lot of public sympathy for. You know, Jerry didn't have a telephone or anything. Uh, fortunately, or unfortunately, at least our friends in autism have kind of made that, you know, I'm listening to NPR, they're interviewing a young man who's a idiot savant and so forth on my way to the airport yesterday. But um, uh, so there, it's getting a little more sexy, if you will. But still, um, it needs all of us. It needs all of us and what we know and so that we can stay connected in the way it has because it's vital and it has to be a living system that is not in a position of defending itself against where direction is going. I mean, mm -hmm. I, have, I believe firmly like RTI is what needs to happen. At some ways it's supposed to be a new idea, but it's a very old idea. Mm -hmm. It's just that general ed didn't have the accountability for the mm -hmm. first two tiers that we had all along. So that should be in place, but we should still be a field that's looking at kids wherever they are on those tiers that, mm -hmm. that need that protection of the law and, and the special um, special programs, but we've really got to keep talking together across to figure out what that is. I mean, first I would say loudly and clearly that make sure you have a good solid background in teaching first, mm -hmm. teaching all kids, teaching that 80% of the kids. If you're a good teacher, you're in cheer with testing and teaching and helping kids learn, then you're in a good position to work with these but don't don't shortcut that. You know, if you go straight to specialising, you don't. In my opinion, don't have the base. The best behaviour specialists I've come across are the ones who were master teachers. Uh, but that that's ideal again. So the best advice I have would be one to get as much experience as you can with teaching in general, and then a zero in on the, uh, the kids with problem behaviour, and then if you do decide to specialise, uh, so I tried to say today, make sure you're familiar with the early literature, particularly uh, Skinner stuff and all that early literature. Secondly, uh, the, the current research, make sure you're familiar with the range of stuff that's out there. And then, if you can, find out what teachers are effective with the harder kids, harder to manage, and what do they do, and so on. So it's, 
it's a big step from teaching the 80% to the harder kids, but uh, the information's out there. And, uh, and to keep in mind that you, you, you might be considered an expert, but you always know you, that you, you're going to have a hard time reaching that kid. There's always kids that are going to make you realise you don't know that much. <laughs> 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 what you know about there doesn't apply here. So you still got to be asking questions and starting over and never get in the comfort zone. No, yeah. they want the kids want to right, work to do that. Or some of them won't. Yeah. So it, I guess it's uh, getting as familiar as you can with teaching and then secondly what's out there in the technology and the strategies and so on. Is there anything we in higher ed should be doing to and, and facilitate? Think, is What should we as professors in higher education be doing to facilitate the learning of our students to work with this population? The, I was going to say this earlier but I'll, I'll say it now. Is to make sure we, we don't get too distant from classrooms. You know, the whole criticism of the college professor is the ivory tower. Mm -hmm. You know, when was the last time you saw a kid or a teacher? But try and keep in touch with what teachers are dealing with. If you come up with strategies, are great if you're working with three kids, but if you're working with 23 or 33, it's not going to work. So staying in tune, you know, I'd love to, you can't mandate things, but get your students out into the classroom. Go out and take data and watch what they're doing. Ask teachers what they're up against and so on. But staying in touch with where the rubber hits the road. I've pretty much covered that, but I, you know, I'm not pessimistic about the future. I think there is lots of hope, but I think we need to be careful to really mentor new people in the future and educate them about the history of our field so that they realize about Pioneer House and where this field came from and the foundations. You know, I said to Jim Kaufman um, a couple years ago at TECDD when he was retiring and Steve Burnett and others, you know, that I said, I felt like our, our founding fathers were retiring and he laughed. He goes, Maureen, I'm not the founding father <laughs> here, you know, I'm like the second generation. And, and that's important as people retire that we really, you know, take a look at what their contribution has been and we educate people who are coming into the field about that history. And, you know, that kind of speaks to kind of your question is that that's what I would say to people in, in the field is get to know the field. I, I, I tell new people to the field would um, to stay humble and compassionate uh, both at the same time because I think the, the compassion is important the being being humble around your work and, and knowing that teaching is an honorable profession to stay stay in that zone to um, to really always think about checking your assumptions and biases at the door as you go into the classroom because those can really cloud your work and not to take uh, this, uh, not to take a lot of the stuff that's thrown at you personally, that it's either coming from uh, a play, you're symbolic of something to some children and youth, uh, you're symbolic of adults, and you have to prove yourself otherwise and build trusting relationships, and to be really centered and clear and direct and be the warm demander, authoritative kind of person, but not the authoritarian. So you have to work in cooperation and build relationships with both uh, your colleagues as well as your students. Um, I, I would. You know, I, again, I said how uh, affected I was by community interagency work. So I'd always say go beyond your classroom and don't get locked within your classroom, but try to reach out both uh, clearly to family members and to try to understand uh, their situation and to try to do things with family members to understand the role that disability has on an individual, a family, a system. Um, and I would uh, really encourage uh, new entrants, in, particularly in the field of behavior disorders, to reach back historically and look at the work of Nick Hobbs and that Nick Long carried forward in the Riyadh movement and think about the principles that are there in the Riyadh movement. And the one I would uh, pass on to them that I try to practice every day, every day is to, to make sure you and your students have joy 
every day in the classroom and that you rely on that joy to have celebrations and rituals that will carry Well, on. I think, you know, this is the best meal of special education, first of all. You know, I mean, we are the uh, SEAL Team 6 of uh, you know, special ed. Because we not only have to, you know, deal with the behavior, we, have, we not only have to teach these kids like other teachers sure. in special ed have to do, but we, these kids are much more difficult, you know, in terms of proportional number that get into special education that need services more severely. And also, um, we not only have to teach them, but we have to manage their behavior and then kind of deal with the stigma and rejection from other teachers and kids in the school and so forth. So it really is an elite, you know, this is like joining SEAL Team 6. I mean, if you want to join the regular infantry, go into learning disabilities. Or naval aviators. Right. <laughs> You know, if you want to be an elite, this is the group to be in. And but to prepare yourself, I think you need to, right off the bat, you know, start thinking, you know, not only about our, you know, taking advantage of our great behavioral strategies and kind of, you know, you know, uh, trying to get to people who can give you a package of those, or at least set to put together a package for yourself as you're learning them and see where they fit into the overall scheme. Um, but I think also I would recommend that they start to look, you know, at issues of psychiatric disorder so they can not only can they refer appropriately when they need to and, and, and identify these when they need help, but also I think, um, you know, get a sense of uh, what, what help they need and, and, and they're going to be working with parents and I think that's one of the critical things. You know, when parents got their kids on medication or when parents got, uh, you know, kids that don't aren't, uh, you know, socially or behaviorally like other siblings in their family or the kids in the classroom, the other kids in the neighborhood, you know, to be able to kind of counsel those parents and, and kind of alert them, you know, to things that need to be done and so forth. Now, you have to be careful about that because you mentioned it and you might have to pay for it, you know, yeah, yeah. That because the school might be held responsible. But there are ways of saying, you know, we've done everything we can, here's what I've done that works in the classroom. This is something you might try at home. What advice would you offer to those just entering the field of emotional behavior disorders? Reconsider. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, what would I really tell them? This is not going to be easy, but if the kids get better, you know you did it. It was not the 50 minute a week session with a psychotherapist that fixed his behaviors. It was you with your daily program, a highly structured program. It was you because you really cared enough to take these children on to start with. Uh, I've always rather liked people with mental disorders and they seem to know that. If there is one in the neighborhood, he'll find me anywhere. My husband and I can be out to dinner and somebody will stop at the table and ask me, what are you eating? And Bruce will say, one of yours? And I'm, yes, <laughs> yes, one of mine. I don't know this person, but he looked at me and I looked back at him and was not afraid of him and would take him seriously. And this, this is a serious issue. I've had people, uh, Patients at mental institutions lean over and kiss me on the cheek as I walk by because they would look at me and I would just look back and all it was was a look. It was not a daring look or a hostile look. It was you, just the you, look. You acknowledged them. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. I acknowledge them. They are real people. I'll nod my head. I'll speak. I had a parent thank me not too long ago for speaking to her daughter in a supermarket. Her daughter had Down syndrome and they were walking together and the younger woman said, I work here. And I said, do you really? What time do you work? And she said, three o'clock. I work at three o'clock and I got off at seven. And she said, I do that every day. And I said, you must be very proud of yourself. That's a good job. She said, yes, it is. And she leaned over to pick something else, and her, something up, and her mother said, thank you. For what, ma'am? For speaking <laughs> to my daughter. 
so many people ignore her. And I thought, I can go into my routine here. I can tell her I'm a retired professor of special <laughs> education. <laughs> yeah, and I know how to speak to your daughter. But I didn't, but it occurred to me, I guess a lot of people do. And that's not, that's not fair. My goodness, do we need public education still? And most of all, about children with EBD. Because people are so afraid of them. And they just ask to be treated as human beings. Normally, if they're loose on the street, they're safe enough to be out there. among others that I liked. But he used to talk about um, our students as being, being viruses, meaning <laughs> that they would go out into a system and spread. <laughs> yeah, and, um, and I would say that's really important. It is very difficult for folks in behavior disorders and folks in regular ed who are getting information about what really works with kids to hold true to that when they get out. And um, we try to prepare them for that, but that's something that is really difficult to do. So that would be my advice. Hold on to it and do it. And I would say that it's an exciting field to be in. Uh, the beauty of working with children with emotional and behavioral disorders is that they keep us on our toes. Okay. And about the time we have figured out <laughs> anything that they could possibly do, they come up with something new. <laughs> so we have to be lifelong learners because yes. we never have all of the answers and I always say to them that anybody that tells you that they have all of the answers in working with these children go the other way very quickly That's because right. <laughs> yes. you have to be a lifelong learner uh, but the field is very exciting and I want to piggyback on what Mary Beth said too I mean just the importance to me about being involved in your professional organization because again since you are lifelong learners you need that network of support of other individuals who are facing the same challenges that you're facing. So that's very important. And then, of course, I have to put a plug in that our folks in our area, more than any other, I'm convinced, must be advocates for our children. Yes. Because our children don't have a lot of people out there advocating for them, and they really need us to stand up for what they're going to need, and then we need to teach them to advocate for themselves. So in our culture, I think, is an anti-prevention um, mindset. And I've tried to think about this, and, and I published an article in 1999 in Exceptional Children, and I've written a chapter about this, and I've talked about it, and have written more things about it. But here's the deal, prevention is a very hard sell. Prevention of anything. Getting ready for something. You can't prevent what you will not need. You cannot prevent what you will not anticipate and prepare for. And so uh, people think when it comes to academic failure and misbehavior that by anticipating it, you are causing it. They also don't recognize that if you want to do prevention, you have to involve more people. You have to serve more kids. So if you say, right now, if you say, oh, we're serving too many kids, it's too easy for kids to get served by special ed. Well, you sort of nailed the coffin on prevention, didn't you? I mean, you, you can't have it that way. You have to serve more cases. Maybe it's sort of special ed. Maybe it's a modification, but you have to involve more kids, not fewer. And it's just a mathematical thing. You just look at the curve of a distribution and you understand that. You also have to take the risk, prefer the risk, of the false positives to the false negative. You can't have it any other way. You can't say, well, we certainly wouldn't want to identify a kid who shouldn't be identified. And yet what we hear 
in our professional conferences, read in our journals, is how terrible it is to identify a kid who doesn't need help. Now, mind you, I don't think we have research that says we have a lot of kids that were misidentified. In fact, the data that Hill Walker showed this morning would lead me to believe there are a lot of kids who are false negatives. That is, there are kids who should be identified and helped, and they're not getting it. All the data are on that side, as far as I know. No data show we get a lot of kids swept up in this special ed obsession who really don't need the help. They don't need the service. So, you know, I get a little frustrated. All those elements are there, and I think those elements will, again, as I said earlier, have a profound effect on our field. Uh, now, the same token, though, I, I'm kind of, uh, uh, perhaps uh, afraid that uh, with new certification requirements, uh, talking about cross-categorical, non-categorical, uh, this person called EBD teacher uh, may not be around much, much longer. And, uh, and I'm not sure whether that's uh, a good thing or not. Uh, I don't believe it is, it is, because again, we do need to have a distinct group to advocate for this, uh, uh, for this student. Some will have positive behavior supports, broader, district-wide, and so forth. Those will remain influential. But I think our identity, uh, being able to relate, going back to the core, is extremely important. And uh, I think at this point, we, we're losing it. Uh, uh, you uh, hear about CCBD membership, for example. And, uh, we're losing like 10% of our um, subscribers every year. So we're down like 5,000 or whatever it is. And that's gonna continue. And, uh, so the allegiance that you see in this group, so to speak, even here, it's not out there. Advice is much more micro. Wear sunscreen, wear your seatbelt. Uh, early in one's career, Try to finish your doctorate before you start having children and family responsibilities. Have fabulous child care. Have a loving spouse and maybe not necessarily someone in the field. Uh, write every day. Accept the toughest editor you can get at the earliest point you can get her um, because you will always benefit from that. Uh, read widely. Be nice to people because those uh, who work for you, one day you may find yourself working for them. Uh, it's a small field and you don't want to burn too many bridges in it because you'll need those bridges eventually. And I, I I think it's very important, or at least it has been to me, not to ever get too, too far from the field, from the real, the people about whose work this is all focused. Um, I think a life without children in it is a fairly drab existence. Uh, my own addiction to children and to those with trouble um, perhaps has sent my academic trajectory uh, at times in a downward spiral, but I've never regretted it. I, I, I think Kim Pajanic was uh, a mentor of mine in psychiatry, and he said we shouldn't do research on those we don't serve. And I think that was true. <coughs> so that would be my advice. Yeah. Uh, there are four pieces of advice I give to all the students that I, that I train, whether they're going to go out and be teachers or if they're going to go into higher education, if they're going to the districts. And that first one is find your passion. Mm -hmm. It's like life, our life is just simply too short not to do what you're most passionate about. Sure. 
And the second part of that, though, is, is in order to sustain that passion, I, I encourage them all to secure your oxygen mask first. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like the biggest hypocrite for saying this, but I'm just going to go ahead and say it, that you know we really do need to encourage people to take time to take care of themselves. Mm-hmm. I know. I know. I know. But if I was balanced, I'm so <laughs> But I feel like we need to, as we're preparing people to take this job on, teach them you know, to take care of their body, you know, by exercising, take care of their mind, by surrounding themselves with a support mm-hmm. group, and really, you know, remember that this is so important what we're doing, but it is one piece of a larger thing, that we have families and that we have people that we care about that we need to not like, re- not neglect. And I know I'm a hypocrite, and I just want to check that off right now. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, I feel so hopeful for this. Like, people in the teaching community, we get these kids for more waking hours yep. per day yeah. than yeah. their parents do. Yes. And I take tremendous comfort in that. And for me as a mother, I'm glad to send my kids to school where they do. They're in inclusive environments, and they have been peer tutors, and I have one child that does have special needs, and I feel like my kids have gotten to see both sides of that, and I couldn't be more proud. But I feel like they're well taken care of when I they're dropped off, and I really want to make sure that when, when we send out a teacher to go work with our kids with emotional and behavior disorders, they've got them for seven and a half, and they need to love them like they're of their own and really hold them to the highest standards. And the last thing I tell people, whether you're going out to be a researcher, if you're going out to be a teacher, if you're going to go out be a parapro, you need to build that school's capacity to sustain change so that mm-hmm. each year, it's like I, I encourage my students to think of like what's going on in school as like a constitution. They should be gaining new information all throughout the year, make revisions during the summer, make amendments so that it continues to improve. But really, I don't want to ever be like the... I don't want schools that I work with to feel like they're victims of hit and run research. That like you run in, yeah, I got this grant, yeah. and I get this data, and then right. I'm going to leave. I feel like anything that I learn, if it's worth, you know, if it's worth adoption, then it's it's the responsible thing to do mm-hmm. to stay in that site until they're ready to run it on their own. And I think building our personal own capacity and building schools' capacity to continue to be good learners to support our kids. I can be optimistic, <laughs> even for a cynic. Um, we've had a district-wide initiative in the district where I live. And we have an alternative school for, for behavior disorders. And I routinely meet with the principals and just kind of update them on what we're doing and ask them about their concerns about behavior and the kids and so forth. And we're sitting around with the elementary school principal, and there's 18 of them. And we started talking about our alternative BD school. And they were asking questions about who gets in. Is it just IP kids? Is it all kids? And, and one of the principals like, you know, I would really just soon keep these kids. I would like the services, but I really would just rather have them in my building. Because when I send them out, we lose time, and then they come mm-hmm. back, and he's behind. And, and all of a sudden, all these principals start nodding their heads, like, yeah, well, I just soon keep them, too. And I'm just sitting there grinning. <laughs> and they're mm-hmm. looking at me like, are you OK? I said, <laughs> I'm more than OK. I said, listen to this conversation. This is a very different conversation mm-hmm. than we had three years ago, where we couldn't build enough classrooms out there to get rid of these kids. Mm-hmm. What we've done is give them the skills, the resources, and the time mm-hmm. to understand and build systems to support kids. They understand what they lose with these kids, and they understand they're coming back. Uh, again, that's my optimism. We have to figure out as a, a field how we jump on those things and take advantage of those. Again, also advocating for those kids at that extreme end. Um, so, you know, I, I see that, that again. That's our future. We'll continually sort of walk that tightrope in that we definitely have to share our skills, um, and and always continuing to make sure we're also serving those kids at kind of that extreme end of that spectrum uh, are continuing. You mentioned before, you got to begin with yourself. Uh, and you have to look into yourself and begin to say, why do you want to commit yourself to a program where you're going to be rejected, you're going to be resisted, uh, there's no immediate uh, pleasure you have to learn and earn trust and relationship. And once you finally get it, the kid moves on and you get somebody else. And so it means that you can't get your needs met from these kids. It means that you have to get your needs met in other interpersonal relationships. Uh, And that's so critical. Mm -hmm. And so the one thing is I would always ask your motivation and I think many people think they can compensate. And the rescue fantasy is something, it's a good beginning, but you've got to put it sure. within the framework of what do you mean when uh, 
uh, he, he violates your values uh, and it triggers your own unresolved issues, you see. And, um, so there's, there's that. The other thing is, is you need the peer support group. And um, as I look back, the, the groups that went through our program, they developed, they continued their relationship after the program. And that caused them a bonding. You know, I have a belief that that bonding occurs when people go through a common stressful event together. And if it's successful, then you come out of that saying, wow, we did it. And not only that, you can use it in the future. And how many times have you gone to your reunion and you met an old friend and you say, do you remember the time? Mm -hmm. And what you talk about is something that went wrong or bizarre, but you got away with it or you did it. You survived. You survived it. And that, and that would be a negative bonding <laughs> we're talking about. That during this process, we would like them to develop that sort of bonding with each other. And I don't see that happening. That's for, for kids with emotional behavior disorders. Um, well, that they, that they will continue to receive services in public schools uh, in one way, shape, or another. I think one of the things uh, in the future is there may be fewer and fewer of those children that are actually identified. And we've always historically been very under-identified based on what we know from population statistics. And I, I, th I think that for kids with emotional behavior disorders, the traditional types of um, identification and traditional placements that students with EBD have been in uh, may not be as prominent. I, I, there may be a lot more kids with emotional behavior disorders that aren't formally identified because they're so costly to schools and, and with, with, with financial constraints. But they will be in public schools. Uh, kids with emotional behavior disorders will, will be there. I think the challenge is, is that an area that schools say we're going to help them because that's part of our mission and we want to surround ourselves with people that can do that. I think if public schools um, embrace that, or at least certain segments of public schools, I think the future could potentially be fairly bright, relatively speaking, for kids with emotional behavior disorders, um, whether they're identified as, as that or not. Um, just because, hopefully, for the increased awareness of mental health and the issues, one of the things that uh, teachers repeatedly want more information on, and, and my colleague and, and good friend of yours, Reese Peterson, has done a lot, is teachers are just, just hungry for information on psychopharmacology and different medications and how are kids impacted, what are the effects, what are the side effects, because teachers have so many kids uh, that are on medications for various, um, you know, psychiatric disorders in their classroom. I'm hoping that bodes well in terms of the awareness that uh, this is a condition that we can treat and that we have uh, the interventions and skills uh, to be able to uh, produce improvements in children that have emotional behavior problems or disorders, um, improvements in their uh, social and academic behaviors. So I behind is showing the general ed community is that, that that there's probably a third of their kids or more that aren't doing very well either and that the standard bill of fare of the way they commonly teach will not work and they've known that for many many years but now it's sort of it's now it's a high stake that they have to fix it they have to change it a little bit like that so my advice w would be first of all read widely I was advising a teacher, I'd say read widely. Um, read things outside your field. Read things that are different from what you're assigned. Read things that that sort of whack you on the side of the head, and that's the phrase that they used. Um, the second thing I would say is is, uh, is is learn your craft well. You know, study really hard to learn your craft well. And, and that's a lifelong process. That's not something that happens in, in no pre-service education. You, you can inoculate it, you can front load all you want, but the, you, no matter how good you are, you're never going to teach them enough. Because for one thing, half of what they have to learn is, is within 
their thing within the experience of actually doing it. The, the other thing I, I, and I tell all my teachers this is learn the, learn the learn do cycle, which is that it's a three year cycle. That when you get a new job, you're learning it and doing it at the same time, and that's exhausting. And in the second year, you're just doing it because you're so damn happy not to be learning it anymore. But you don't innovate anything, you just do whatever you're taught. And then in the third year, you make it your own. And you start to innovate and change and make it go. And if people know that up front, then they, they have a way to, to put a handle, a concept around it, what they feel emotionally and experience. I mean, the first year you do anything new, and I've, I've had the luxury of, of going from a professor to a PI on major research grants to a, an administrator to a, I mean, to, to all kinds of different jobs over my lifetime, and every one of them, the cycle's been the same. It doesn't make any difference how confident or how talented you are, how experienced you are. When you try something really new, the first year is hell on wheels. That's all there is to it. It just feels that way. And, but if you give them a way to do that. And so, and then I, I really do think that, that, um, that we'll ultimately come around to the notion of, of smaller schools. And we'll ultimately Concomitant to that, I think school policies that are absolutely brain dead, like zero tolerance, uh, and the criminalization of, be, of child behavior by schools, which again propels uh, youth rather quickly and directly into the juvenile justice system. And you know, we talk about a school to prison pipeline, um, which is really not. I mean, that's an oversimplistic uh, rendering of, the, of it, as Hill Walker points out. Um, but in fact, uh, we are seeing an increase in uh, direct referrals uh, by schools uh, of youth to uh, juvenile courts and uh, arrests for uh, behaviors that are, in fact, uh, not tolerated, not criminal. Um, and I think that's a very uh, direct outcome of the attitude that, that promoted No Child Left Behind and other um, practices that simply say, if students are not here to learn and excel at that, uh, we're not really interested in serving them. Um, and you know, as, as Hill Walker points out, and many others who have, have written as well, uh, the societal costs of this educational blunder are just overwhelming. It costs uh, a reasonable, a fairly conservative estimate is about $60,000 per year per bed uh, to house a juvenile in a, in a detention center or a correctional center. Now, uh, public education costs uh, on average about $4,000 per year. Uh, and uh, John Q. Taxpayer pays for both those tuitions. Which one would we rather have, you know? But the public does not get that. And the public doesn't get it because our policymakers don't get it. They don't read our research. They don't respond to our, our calls for papers and, and, or, or listen to what we have to say. Um, they get their information from the popular media, and the popular media is of the opinion that schools are made safer if we get the thugs out and keep them out. And we have to put the lie to that. You know, that simply is not happening. And I, I, uh, I worry significantly about that. Another aspect of this same phenomenon, perhaps, is, the, is what uh, professionals refer to as a siloing effect. Mm. That, that was my line. Oh, well. <laughs> but we do. We, uh, you know, we work in silos. I uh, prepared a paper on the, uh, the epidemiology of behavior disorders and um, looked at a lot of research from the education field. And, uh, and subsequent to that uh, was writing a paper for uh, a juvenile justice audience and uh, discovered a whole different literature that didn't cross over to any degree 
not to any degree was there uh, transference of, of information from one field to the other. So to the extent that we think in silos and work in silos, we will continue to miss the point that these are all the same. And I remember the great saying, you can't burn out if you've never been on fire. Yeah. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> I like that. So, very good. Yes. Um, when I see teachers who, who don't have that passion, and that's why I went to higher ed, and I saw teachers around who didn't yeah. have that, you know, deep-seated belief that we can make a difference, and I can make a difference. But, you know, you hit re reality in higher ed pretty quickly, too. Yeah. <laughs> But, Two faculty um, meetings will do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree with Katie, that professional <laughs> development. And I just wonder, how is it they don't seek it? And, and, and it's, I, I know to each his own and her own, but I, I just don't know where I'd be if I didn't have all the support around me. But uh, we have to also know what you need. So. And Frank would always said too, if you're not exhausted at the end of every day, you're not doing your job. Very good. Very and good. so, and yeah. it's a great So far, so good, right? We're still good. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But, I would say you have to find your community of support because a lot of negativity out there. Um, and I think it would be very, I mean, the, we know the burnout rate is through the roof. So I think you really have to take care of yourself, have a balanced life have that passion, but find your community of support of other people that are passionate also, and I have that hope and have the belief that things can get better. Um, I know in, in schools every day, there's a lot of people that, that really feel hopeless. So you gotta, in order to keep yourself going, you have to do things like coming here and, and finding those people that, that keep you going. Toxicity is uh, really uh, an important issue. I, f I think, um, I, I know I've reflected back when I've been preparing teachers that maybe the first 10 or so years of working to help teachers do a better job with kids out in the schools, things were getting better. I felt that s teachers' skills were improving. They were, they were always valuing and anxious to learn and apply uh, good ideas. Uh, and, but, and so, but the overall climate in schools were improving. There was enthusiasm, there was energy, and so on, and at a certain point, in the uh, 80s, towards the end of the 80s, early 90s, we reached a peak and unfortunately things have been declined. And I don't attribute that to a change in the teachers, the young people that we're trying to help get ready to teach, but more the uh, overall climate about schooling uh, soured. Um, there began to be a lot of negative attention to schools and then in particular the, um, the idea that these kids are bad kids and ought to be punished instead of uh, helped. Um, and I think really the uh, sense uh, that the teachers are going out there and really being overwhelmed by the problems, the needs of the kids, the risk factors that are existent both in the schools and also in the families and the communities. It's, uh, it's kind of like you feel like yourself in a, in a Katrina hurricane in slow motion where um, all of the building is just being ripped apart uh, by a kind of overwhelming force that is beyond anyone's control. And I don't think anybody uh, perceives that, I've never had a sense that that's something we should then give up on and, and back off from. Uh, it's not that, but it's uh, not the feeling of success or moving forward that I think we had had for a period of time. So I guess I, I do reflect very much what uh, Hill Walker said this morning and what you fellows have said, that um, that, that is the, really the most discouraging part of our jobs right now is the lack of ability to really uh, have any apparent large-term impact. I think of those people that are going to come out and have the kids that I'm going to advocate for and I'll be working with and trying to do what's best for that child. And remembering back a long time ago too when I was a teacher I'd say first of all be patient everything does not happen overnight overnight their behaviors do not happen overnight uh, be creative I, I too often I think we tend to latch on to the one big answer and there never is one big answer there's an amalgamation you try different things you try to figure out what works best for this kid particularly those that you know are always going to do something a little different um, Third, keep trying. Don't give up. Keep trying. And then fourth, keep learning. Um, 
one of the things, and, and one of the people that I didn't mention, but who really made and continues to this day to make a major impact on me, is Jim Kaufman. And every time I see Jim and talk to him, I learn something. I learn wonderful things. I learn things I can use in my everyday life. Uh, so never ever quit learning. And then I guess the last thing is don't ever quit caring. Uh, keep that passion. Remember it. Remember why you're doing it. And, and just keep caring about them. Those are the things that I see. And then I'm in the schools, so I see what's going on in the schools. I, you know, I think that there is a lot to be positive about. I think that I think that the teachers who are, we are putting out there are just as dedicated, if not more dedicated. You know, that woman who got the teaching award last night, that's an incredible person. That's an incredible person. So I feel pretty positive about that as long as we keep doing our job at the, at the college level and, and teaching them to do the things that are going to be effective uh, for kids. Uh, as far as, as as new people coming out with PhDs to fill the ranks at the universities, I, I'm chair of that department, so I see, you know, I get, I have to, I get to, I, I get to talk to everybody who comes in to interview across music education, social studies ed, science education, and, and the people who come in and, and interview for special education, I think are by far trained better. You know, they can do more, and they rely more on evidence. You know, we just had a person in right before I came down here uh, from Vanderbilt who interviewed with us, and, and she came in and talked about her research, and she talked about how she wanted to teach, and she talked about what she had done in terms of teaching, and she had that look. You know the look in, in <laughs> that distinguishes special educators from, from others, that kind of, that kind of crazy. That kind of <laughs> crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's that, a while that, back. Yeah, <laughs> and, and it's not so much crazy, it's, it's, no. it's, almost, it's almost this passion that you know, that borders on OCD, you know, you know. <laughs> and so I, you know, you see that and, and you say, oh God, you know, I mean, it's just, it gives you chills to see that sort of thing. So I'm, I'm real buoyed by, by that kind of thing. You know, I, there's some things that we, that we can worry about. I think a lot of times we don't teach the basics, you know, we tend to reinvent the wheel. You know, Herring and Phillips years ago talked about structure, you know, and, and how we need to have that structured environment or these kids aren't gonna do well. There are generations of, of kids and students coming through our programs who have never heard of Pioneer House, you know, and the therapeutic in you and, and all of the things that were done there. And I, I think that's unfortunate that, you know, in a lot of cases, some of those things don't get, get lost. I'm also a little worried about, as these folks said, what inclusion is doing to our field. You know, inclusion was not something that was, that was instituted based on, it, it was not a, uh, it's an advocacy variable. It's not a treatment variable. It's something, the more inclusion you do, the better you are, and that's the measure. If you're doing a lot of it, then you're doing well. Instead of, inclusion is a treatment like any other treatment. Who's it good for? Under what conditions is it good? And we're still not there. We're into the second decade of inclusion, and we still don't have a date on it. And I'd like to be in there. That it's such an exciting field, but you better come in with your eyes open. Or it's OK to come in to test the waters, but once you test the waters, you have to decide, is this the place you should be? I just think there's some very, very strong, smart students who come into our field because they've been motivated by a McCall's Magazine article, <laughs> or they've seen this really great TV show, or they've heard these romanticized tales of Harrison Ford doing something with some kid, you know, and sort of like, yep, that's my place. And they come in and they just find that it's not their thing. Uh, but for the people that have their, their calling in life for that, uh, what an exciting feel. And I would say, boy, you know, embrace it, you know, go with it. But make sure it's your thing. Uh, and I bet all of us who work in higher education can attest to this. I get calls all the time from people who are middle-aged or in their 30s who hold law degrees or who hold nursing degrees or who hold a business degree who say, I'm tired of sort of doing something I don't want to do and I'm sort of looking to do what I really love. And I think maybe education 
for special education is what I want to do. I just think that's wonderful. And, you know, our suggestion, um, at least my suggestion, and what I've heard other people that I work with say is, you know, go for it. But, you know, our suggestion is try it out first, you know. Make sure that shoe fits before you buy it for life, you know. And, you know, if it's your thing, oh, boy, what an exciting life. The other thing that I would echo is just uh, what I heard Dick Whalen say last night at our awards dinner uh, about the life of a college professor. It's the best profession you can possibly <laughs> choose. Now, there are days that I <laughs> would, uh, uh, with your eyes open. But, but coming in with the idea of being of saying, asking the question of saying, is there a need? Yes. Is there going to be a need, an ongoing need? Yes. And what, regardless of what may be taking place regarding uh, certification standards of states or, or reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act or whatever, uh, th that if we really say it's our guild or our trade talking about improving behavioral outcomes for kids, that there really is a future there. And that things have, that we, that uh, uh, depending on whether we'll be optimist or pessimist, we're saying it's not going to be obsolete in the near future. So if you want to tackle those things, and if you really want to think about some things where there are not good answers, I mean, compared to what might be some other areas like medicine or, or, or uh, uh, what's happening as far as pharmacological intervention, I mean, the, the, the answers are not going to be as discreet and clearly defined, and the questions are always going to be tremendously complex. And there will be a new breed of symposium that will be meeting for the next 25 years debating the same types of questions. Uh, to me, that's a pretty exciting entry for new professionals coming in. If, if through their programs they could say uh, the issue about knowing what to do Monday morning and having that answer for me every week is not going to be there. If people can accept that ambiguity then I think it's a tremendously exciting field to be in. What other field can you literally think of just about any question you want to ask you can legitimize it saying, that's a part of my field. I mean, as far as what's happening socially or what's happening with individuals or what's happening as far as, I mean, it really is a, uh, uh, an area where we have uh, uh, a lot of things we could talk about uh, over a Coca-Cola or something like that that, uh, that really is, is not, it's not boring. And I think it's pretty exciting. And it's, it's it, for, for a certain, we, we, we actually did, a, as part of the Metropolitan Area Child Study, because we know drive-by in-services don't work. And I kind of take, you know, this whole thing of, of um, the Weight Watchers thing. And so we actually did a peer triad process where teachers had to agree to be part of a, of, a, of a triad. And so one week, you'd be the host teacher. I would come in and I would watch you teach. And I would give you feedback. Two things that you did well, two things that you improved upon. Later in the week, you'd go watch him and do the same kind of thing. So you'd get feedback from two of your peers. On, and you could focus, watch me with Randy, because I'm going to rip that little sucker's head off. Yeah. You know, it could be, you know, um, watch me in terms of my reading, because they're just not getting this lesson, whatever, you know. And But then we had things we were looking at. Next week, I'd be the host teacher, you two would come in. The next week, you'd be the host teacher, and we'd come in. So in three weeks, you, you gave feedback twice, and you got feedback twice. Now, in, a couple of things that we found very interesting. It had the major changes in teacher behavior had very little to do with the feedback they got. It was the feedback they gave. So I go in and I watch you become sarcastic. And as you become sarcastic with this kid, I see the whole class turn on you because you just violated one of their expectations that adults shouldn't do. And I realized, wow, sarcasm is not a good practice. <laughs> you know, It wasn't the fact that somebody told me I shouldn't do it. It was that I watched this and thought, whoa, this is not a good thing at all. Um, the other thing that we found that was really interesting, I had a doc student who did a study, and we'd, we'd been gone. She wanted to know how long do interventions stay in place after the university people leave. And so she took a number of interventions and went in and, to see what remnants of that intervention were still in, in place. What she found is 56% of our teachers were still meeting weekly with no feedback whatsoever from the administration. So it had enough value to the teachers themselves to maintain it. Um, and I think, I, think, I think we're going to have to look at systems like that. I think we're going to have to find something that, one is that people are there, that, that, that there's a credibility. That we, we would choose ourselves. You know, it was, you know, the only thing we had, the only requirement was that you couldn't have the same planning period because that's when you'd go in and observe. And so I picked you. So I, I kind of trust that you're not going to mis, you know, misuse the information that you may see. And it was just a way to get some feedback. I want to work with you. So I think that there's some advertising. 
I, I, so uh, I think that uh, we're going to continue to, uh, uh, as long as this core group of people uh, do a good enough job as the, our forefathers did in terms of keeping the field and traditions going and trying to keep us with this. So if Kim and I do our jobs well and train our doctoral students to in sort of what our uh, mentors trained us in, then I think there's going to continue to be a core group of people who will, um, you know, push the field in terms of, you know, considering evidence-based practices once again and looking at what we can do to influence those third sorts of things. Uh, a negative I think that might be coming up, and I probably should have talked about this earlier, but I do have a bit concern that the future is not going to fold well for kids with the most serious behavior problems. I think that there's been a great emphasis in the last 10 years on children who are at risk for this condition. Uh, and I don't know of any policy or program that has demonstrated that we are making a huge dent in, you know, the pencil breakers becoming desk breakers as we saw that. So, uh, but the field, the, the field in, in our field particularly, there's been a, a stronger movement toward, I think, kids who are at risk. And I think that I'm concerned that, that the children with serious emotional and behavior disorders are that enigma that we don't, they're too hard to mess with, so why are we messing with them? And why are we, you know, those are the kids that we're gonna exclude, those are the kids that we don't wanna involve in our research, and um, or some people don't wanna involve in their research. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, that as we advocate for the broader field that we remember that we mean all kids with EBD, not just the ones who sort of fit into a certain profile. It, it seems to me, uh, advice to anyone coming into a, a new career, make it easy to behave well. <laughs> make it easy, organize your environment in such a way that uh, good behavior, successful behavior, purposeful behavior is more likely. Surround yourself with, uh, with professional colleagues will, uh, who will expect you to perform at the highest level and provide you the, uh, uh, the, the mentoring and the uh, advice and help and support to allow you to do that. I think everybody ought to have what amounts to their own personal advisory board, if you will. Get people together who can help you to be successful and then organize your life and your environment so that you can do it well. And then maintain those, uh, those high standards and be focused on uh, what it is you want to achieve. That's good. And as I recall, the, the one common thing the resilient youngsters have in common is a mentor. That they, they, Somewhere in their life they have a significant adult someplace who, who helps. And when children miss that, then they, they really feel the consequences of that kind of life. I think that's true with, with teachers. If um, it, if they go into this field with the right motivation and knowing that it, it won't be um, grand and glorious every day of the, of the week or the month, and that they also realize there will be days when they're so angry at the children that they can't hardly stand it. Um, but they also will realize that uh, families, parents, and children are extremely grateful and show that in many ways. It's worth it. It amazes me that I still run across former students, um, not too many anymore, <laughs> who are still teaching and uh, um, are hanging in there. And there are others who, after a period, say, you know, I need to get back into a general education classroom and I can go for it. Or they decide they want to be an administrator and they say, go for it. So it's just like my wife told me when we moved to work on a doctorate and moved to Washington, D.C. She just picked up and went and she said, let's go. So that's what I would say to teachers, let's go. Yeah, hey, uh, I, I, again, I'm optimistic about the future and I hope more and more people enter it. Um, we were in the 60s when 88-164 passed and we were going uh, 
we had more students in this field than we could deal with. And they were very interested. Some people came because they'd had experiences in their families, or, and others came because they were just interested. Um, so when you moved back to that disciplinary or interdisciplinary approach to training teachers? Uh, yeah, I was going to make a point that, that LD really crimped our numbers when it became uh, uh, a big program. And that's all well and good, except that, that the, our colleagues in, in learning, specific learning disabilities, didn't, didn't necessarily adopt uh, our strategies mm -hmm. to help care for, for youngsters who don't come in those neat packages. So we, we've, our program anyway, and I expect the one folks had, uh, have is uh, emphasize both parts, whether they're training for that or the other. And uh, I think that was probably true across the country. But at least uh, when, when the teacher would say, well, I teach LD, I don't deal with kids' behavior problems, we could say, no, 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 it didn't work that way. Yeah. So I, I, think, uh, I think in a way part of my optimism is based on the fact that um, human beings are extremely amazing <laughs> animals. <laughs> and, and if they don't blow themselves up first, <laughs> Uh, they, it, it's quite remarkable the things that they can, you know, that they can figure out and the problems that they can solve. Um, if I look at special education as a whole, the situation of many kids with very severe uh, cognitive and physical disabilities is, I think, a lot better. Mm -hmm. and, and I think we have to recognize that we're talking about a particular group of kids for whom a lot of the programming hasn't worked as well. And that's, that's the tragic thing. And, and that's why it's particularly then sad that so many of those kids are put into correctional environments where in spite of the best efforts of the people, and there are a lot of wonderful people who work in corrections, uh, I know people, that, but it's not a good environment. And, and it's not an environment, it's an environment from, in a way it almost confirms them that they're bad kids and it's uh, it's the exception I think who's helped to get back into a more positive uh, place in society I'm not a, I'm a positive person but I see an uphill pull and I see that um, our need for numbers in this country is driving us in the wrong direction and I think that what's going to happen is it's going to implode around No Child Left Behind, and I'm hoping, what I'm hoping is that the feds will let programs begin to exempt out and let them set up their own uh, objectives and documentation of progress and their own standards, <clears throat> because this is not something that's external. There's not a body of knowledge that everyone has to achieve, as in academic work. In our field, it's a personality, it's a personal development. And so that's has to, there are some parameters, and that's what our instrument, our 171 milestones, are. The, that's the structure, the skeleton, the parameters. But within that, to be a fully functioning person, um, you're going to learn it at a different rate, an individual rate, and it almost has to be individualized, even in a group setting. And so how to, that requires a huge amount of skill and a, a capacity to conceptualize all the forces that come to, into the learning and the and personality development. So, so that is to say that um, we need some major changes in higher ed. Okay, tell me what those need to be. All right, that needs to be. I think everyone that teaches teachers in ED, BD, needs to have been do postdoctoral work in treatment centers, in mental health facilities, so that they understand first what emotions are because you can't see it in, a, in an education classroom because it's under clamps and so you can't learn unless you learn in a mental health facility how intense those emotions are and, and how bottled up and, and non, uh, how, how they're not being uh, the reshaping of emotions into constructive outcomes is not one of the most important pe things people can do is find or go to their professors and s find out what are the 50, 100 most seminal pieces of, of research in their field, read them and know them, and understand their history and the commitment of the people who created this knowledge base, and that they are the next.
generation of knowledge producers and be committed to the field. A couple of, of fears that I have is, um, one is I, I, I see a trend, and I hope I'm wrong, but I see a trend that the preparation of future educators is becoming um, more of teaching a bunch of tactics and strategies and not the fundamental principles. And, and I think we've got to make sure somehow we're always teaching the basic fundamental principles with the strategies and tactics as just examples of various ways to apply those principles. But to help, help students understand, uh, and I don't know, we started out that way, but I think we've learned that when a program fails, for example, it doesn't work for a certain child or a group of children, that doesn't mean throw out the whole program. It means go back and see if the, if the basic principles were there and did we violate any and did some of the strategies not include some of those principles. And, and we can do that kind of analysis only if we're well grounded in the fundamental principles first and build the strategies on that. So, so I worry uh, that we've got to make sure our preparation programs really continue to, to be there. And, and, and similarly, I, I think our students and future students need to understand the history. Not, not just the people and, and, and some of the people who helped start the field and keep it going. I mean, that's important, I think. And I'm getting old enough that I think that kind of history and heritage <laughs> is more and more important all the time. But, but it's understanding the history in terms of what we learned yeah, what? and how we learned it. And, and again, it ties back into those principles. But um, w when you get away from those kind of things and you don't understand that learning history of the field, then you have inadvertently you start trying to reinvent the wheels all over mm -hmm. and you waste time and you lose ground. So understanding the history of the learning of our field and the, the people who made that happen is part of that. But it's learning that history of the, of, of the learning process for us. And then making sure we teach those principles. I think are going to be two really essential things. A, a decade or two from now, if we lose those, we're going to lose a lot of ground. And I think in a way that is not common to others. You know, for a while you can think, well, that's just, you know, that's the way it is in a professional organization. You get to know people and you have these connections. But I don't believe that that's the case. As I, as I become peripherally involved with others or talk to friends, uh, it's, uh, there is something different. There is something different. And I think, I think you're right. A lot of it is a shared humiliation. Or, <laughs> or just sort of finding something that what we often do as teachers is so stressful and so overwhelming and, and pretty much hard for anybody to believe that you go back and do. In fact, one of the things you don't want to examine too much is why you keep going back to that sort of <laughs> abuse yourself. And then to be surrounded by people who get it is just a lovely thing. And I, I think that is why this becomes such a close group of people, such a positive group. Um, events, I, I've always thought of special education as an extremely political arena. So I think we are, I think we are the canary in the mine for a lot of educational uh, situations. Uh, things happen to us first, uh, attitudes start to freeze for us first, and that's been kind of alarming in, in many ways. I mean, there was the there was the initial excitement that I alluded to of starting to do these things. Not that it didn't exist before then, but it wasn't as uh, unified across the country. Um, then in you know, the 94 142 came in and made that a, a much broader focus. It certainly had some downsides too, but it brought the it brought things to the attention of, of just about every state in the country, which was an exciting thing to watch. Um, we do see that sort of the ebb and flow thing. I, I've always I've always believed strongly in that biological principle that uh, that most uh, organisms and most cultures of organisms are pretty altruistic as long as the resources are good. But once the resources start to dry up, it's the least able that are attacked first. And I know whether they're left to die by the roadside or eaten by their fellows or <laughs> drotted off to the, you know, whatever. Um, Single-celled organisms on, on up do that. And our field represents those folks that are often the first ones to be marginalized or first ones to be yeah. cut from something that happens. So we do become a litmus test for a lot of political situations, which I think actually leads the person to be somewhat depressed over time, <laughs> I think, and a little angry. <laughs> you know, I think, uh, I think many people in this field are table pounders. 
I think there are people that are passionate about things and uh, become politically disillusioned sometimes uh, mm -hmm. because we do see those things begin to happen and, and you have that sort of feeling of I know where this is going to go. I've been down this road before. And you, you bring up over and over again in classes, and you know, one of the, my favorite classes, single class sessions to teach, has always been the, the one where we talk about the, you know, the eugenics movement and we talk about how that's affected people with special needs and that this was you know, not some sort of benign, interesting philosophy. It's something that's right there behind the closet door every day of everyone's life. And we have to spend a lot of time making sure that that sort of thinking never gets a foothold anywhere again. And it, it's, it's, a, it's like that thing, it, it's a place where you pound on one thing's head and the other one pops up over there. It seems to you spend your life doing that. And it keeps <laughs> popping back up again and you have to go back and bang it with a mallet one more time. But, you know. a good analogy. Especially <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you get a prize at the end, but a lot of times you don't. So I, I think that the political aspect of what we do has always been a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's, it's kept a person primed for what's going on and it's been a little discouraging sometimes. Um, hard to watch some of the, the issues that, that come and go under different guises and different names. So I guess I would say the legislative and political issues are events that have really, and will continue to, to shape what we do. And sometimes what we do is just put our heads down and hope it goes over, you know, like you do in a pit in the wildfire so it goes past you and then you can stand up and start doing what you were doing again. I sort of feel like that now. It has a lot of appeal, uh, too. Uh, not because you know uh, there isn't some satisfaction in kind of fighting the good fight, but you some eventually decide uh, it's somebody else's turn <laughs> to do something to this as well. Um, you know, I, I'm not uh, I'm not optimistic about the future uh, for the field. I'm not pessimistic. I think we'll continue to stumble along, and I think that, as Mary Kay said, I think there are um, there are a few good people. I think there will never be enough. Um, people who are committed and caring and nurturing and, and willing to, uh, not only willing, but uh, eager uh, to do this, this, this kind of work, you know, the teaching of the kids with emotional behavioral disorders. It just isn't something that I think most people want to do uh, or can do. But um, something that keeps me going is uh, I, for, for, for my whole career in higher education, I've been teaching late afternoon and evening classes. That's just because that's when our students, who are all teachers, almost all teachers, uh, can come to school. And um, on uh, Tuesday evenings, I have a seminar from 7 until 9.30, and there are uh, 17 teachers in this seminar, which is kind of a large seminar, <laughs> supposedly a research seminar. And they're all, all teachers, with maybe one or two exceptions. Some of them uh, are driving for a more than an hour uh, from campus to come to this seminar. They're working all day. One of them works up in Beatrice, Nebraska, teaches at a school there, mm -hmm. and lives up by the, the, the border. Uh, and so you know, she's been going since maybe 5 in the morning and leaves my class at 9.30 and then drives home and gets up the next day. And, and, and these are people who are, I mean, I, I, I don't know why they do it, uh, other than they, they believe.